Yep. Good evening and welcome to tonight's edition of Newsnight. My name is Joel Senyonyi. Now, His Excellency President Omar El Bashir was expected in the country to meet with President Yori Kaguta Museveni and a couple of other presidents to discuss matters South Sudan and other regional matters. But as some we are expecting, he did not show up. Could it be because uh, he was indicted by the ICC? Of course, our president said that, look, I cannot invite President Bashir and then arrest him from here. And also, Minister of Foreign Affairs said that, look, our position as Uganda is the position of the AU. We still have issues with this whole ICC issue. So, this evening, we want to throw the spotlight on the ICC and uh, what options Africa does have. Andrew Mwenda, I know you're one the, of those the old that man are of the clan. Andrew, but you see, you keep complaining that Look. Obama and uh, all these other people, they grandstand, they say what they, they are not, but you yeah, like exactly. them. So me, I, I grandstand for what I am. <laughs> for them, they grandstand for what they are not. Let's talk ICC. Um, Andrew, I know you're one of those that uh, are clearly against the ICC. And I hear you because I think as Africa, we need to get to a point where we grow up, we begin, begin to manage our own affairs. But what are the options? that Africa does have. The African Court of Justice that we have here does not have any teeth to bite at all. Uh, well, if it doesn't have uh, uh, teeth to bite, perhaps it means that we don't need a court that has teeth to bite. You see, I should first of all tell you that if you are Bashir mm. and you have been fighting with Museveni for the last 30 years, do you, okay, since uh, for the last 26 years, do you think you would trust him to host you and not hand you over to ICC? In the case, Museveni and Uganda were the first to refer a case to ICC. Mm -hmm. They referred Kony there. So I think that Bashir, being the smart dodger that he is, he decided not to come, most likely because he did not trust that Uganda can honor that promise. But I think that Museven actually would honor it because Museven has grown to realize that ICC is a sham. He has uh, lambasted it a number of times. Yes. He has, you see, many African leaders signed on it naively thinking that the ICC is a court that is going to enforce justice. And th you see, if you look at the United Nations and the ICC, the, for a case to go to the ICC, it has to be approved by the five permanent members of the UN. Mm. Of those five permanent members, three are not, not signatories. The US being one of those. The United States, signatories, yes. Russia and China. So in other words, they're saying that the US is saying they should send people to a court it does not recognize. That is one. Look, that is the granted. second thing is this, mm. is that you see people like the Bashirs, if there are crimes they have committed, there are crimes that have been committed in the context of political struggle. Mm. You see, if I come and kill you as an individual, there is a clear personal motive to kill you. But if there is a political contest between the LRA and NRA, that matter cannot be resolved through criminal prosecution. If it has to be through criminal prosecution, it needs to be politically sensitive. Politically sensitive in the sense that the ultimate solution, because it's a political conflict, the ultimate solution has to be political. Look, I do hear you when uh, you put up that, but ultimately, you know, you know, we've got to find ways of resolving this, because you see, if uh, crimes against humanity, you see what happened in Darfur, in the case of Omar el-Bashir, people butchered like a problem, somebody has got to be held responsible, so and uh, I, I, when we talk yeah. about making, you know, creating African solutions for African problems, what do we exactly mean? I keep hearing that, and I think sometimes maybe it's well, too exotic. The, the answer for you is in South Africa, it's in Rwanda, it's in Mozambique. You see, during South Africa, and, uh, during apartheid in South Africa, the apartheid state under the clerk and his other parachute was a very violent and criminal regime which killed, it maimed, it destroyed black lives. You get it. But Mandela understood that the resolution of uh, the problems of South Africa could not be done through courts. So what he said is that, look, we are going to place political reconciliation above criminal prosecution in order to heal political wounds. And we'll establish a, tree, a truth and reconciliation commission where people can go, uh, reveal and apologize for the crimes that they committed so that this country can move forward. Because if you go into criminal prosecution, you are likely to be seeking revenge rather than Do you reconciliation. see that happening in a country like Sudan, for example? Do you see that happening in a country like Central African Republic, if they ever get to that stage? Because you see, mm. both of these sides, you know, they are at loggerheads at each other's necks. I, I, I don't know. And maybe that's why many people are ambivalent. They feel these two guys, they are obstinate, we need to prosecute them and deal mm. with them as uh, should if, be the case. If it happened in Rwanda, in Rwanda there is the International Criminal Court for Rwanda, it is a UN court in Arusha. But if you go to actual Rwanda, the way they were able to resolve more than 4 million cases of people who were in prison, they released millions and millions of people. It was through Gachacha courts. They created mm. local 
traditional courts because they realized that you see although the genocide in Rwanda was organized through the state it was executed by ordinary citizens each one of them grabbing a machete and killing so you had a criminal they inherited a criminal population how do you resolve that matter if you went to through the rule of court process so they said okay we are going to put reconciliation at the head of the process of healing the wounds of Rwanda and I think that South Sudan needs if the international community walked out of out of Khartoum the Sudan of Khartoum, you would have a conversation among South Sudanese and the, the people of Darfur and the people of Khartoum, and from there you can find some political accommodation. Now, political accommodation does not come easily. It can take time. It may take two years. It may take ten years. But I don't think that the solution is in the International Criminal Court. The International Criminal Court is like throwing fire at an burning inferno. Let me ask you, assuming, mm. Joel, right now you are Bashir, mm -hmm. they have indicted you. Mm. What should stop you from killing? Of course, whether you kill what? Already. Already. But you see, it gets back to the argument that we did have last week. And uh, last week after Obama's remarks and you and others went screaming your heads off saying Obama should mind his business. Kalinaki, uh, Daniel Rod, uh, Kalinaki wrote an interesting article and said, look, if Obama pays your medical bills, he has every right to talk about your hygiene. And maybe that's where the ICC comes in. For as long as we keep running to these people, when you have conflicts, you remember what happened in Rwanda? Everybody was saying, where is the Western powers, where is the UN and so on. Now, when they come in preventatively, whether or not that's what they mean, then you complain. I, so we cannot think, complain until we come of age. I think theoretically, Kalinaki was making a very good argument in the sense that if somebody, if you keep, you know I'm against foreign aid. By the way, I mean foreign aid, whether it's in form of uh, advice for Obama, whether it's in form of money, whether it's in form of peacekeepers, relief food, every form of humanitarian aid, I refuse all foreign aid. I think that if we have to suffer, let us suffer our own problems that the solution should come from within. But are we willing so to let me keep come, to them? So let me come to Kalinaki. Kalinaki theoretically is right, but the United States government does not contribute even 1% of the budgets of African countries, I have told you that. And you should know that 47 countries, countries the, the U.S. sends aid directly, and uh, they are in about oh no, 27 countries. Let and fact, let Andrew, me, let you me know tell it. you what happened actually with USAID. For every $100 the United States sends to any country, listen to me, 80 is taken back to America. Yeah, of course they can with 100 on, on the 20 another, remains, on 20 they remains. For starters. So of that 20 that remains, let me tell you, even if I go to the 100 which they give and take away, the United States is the least, is the, is the meanest country, developed country. Because most developed countries have this idea that you must contribute 0.7% of your mm. GDP in aid. The U.S. does not even do 0.1% of its GDP in aid. Well, they are highly indebted. And finally, we have something we agree on. Mm. Aid is not good for Africa. All right, that will do for today's edition of Newsnight. Okay, change.